Next, we have Dr. Ramurthy, who will be discussing about challenging cases with fake virus. Thank you. Uh, I think we are shifting gears a little bit. I'll be talking about challenging cases with fake intraocularensis. Uh, first, let me talk about how I exactly do my fake intraocularensis now. Uh, basically, there's no dilatation because I believe that the protection that the intact iris offers is significant. And uh, or I make the side ports first just to put in a little bit of saline so as to uh, um, make the eyeball tense, make my central incision then inject a little bit of xylocaine with adrenaline combination, non-preserved, that in these young myopes, the pupils dilate very well. And subsequently, I go ahead and introduce a high molecular weight which is viscoelastic, is usually uh, helon, and uh, that's the intraocular, the uh, fake intraocular lens that's being injected. And uh, you make sure that it's opening up in the right way. And essentially, there's no, uh, once I tuck the haptics behind the pupillary margin, there's no need for any irrigation aspiration in these situations because once I start hydrating the main port as well as the side port, you'll find that the whole uh, cohesive viscoelastic tends to flow out as a bolus. And you can see once that uh, viscoelastic starts flowing out, you can see it flowing out through the side ports, then I really sh I'm sure that uh, there's no more viscoelastic left. So because of not dilating the pupil and uh, keeping the iris protecting the anterior surface of the lens, and subsequently not doing any irrigation aspiration, I find that uh, my surgical time is far reduced and also some of the complications that can be associated with this is also significantly less. The, this is what you find most often uh, subsequent to your uh, fake intraocular lens implantation where there's a very ideal uh, uh, 500 micron <clears throat> vault as well as the lens is well centered. But then there are some complex situations I'm going to be dealing with them. Uh, Sometimes when your lens is not in position, and this is something you see on the first post-operative day itself, then all I go in with is with the irrigation cannula and go through the other side port and then uh, generally shift the lens. And if I see it on the first post-operative day, I take it up immediately. And it's very rarely that uh, you see this happening few days later. That's uh, very often because of improper sizing of the lens. One thing you need to remember is that uh, the rotation of the lens will only help if the uh, um, amount of residual error, the spherical equivalent of the amount of residual error is almost zero. That is, if it's minus one with plus two diopters of uh, cylinder, then rotation of the lens is going to help because it's going to redistribute the power. But if it's just a simple sphere or a cylindrical power, rotation of the lens is not going to have much of an impact because you're not adding or subtracting any power by rotating these lenses. And uh, then this is a uh, video about uh, cataract which has happened subsequent to a um, fake intraocular lens implantation. And only if it's anterior subcapsular cataract, as you see in this case, then you can really blame the lens for it. Very often the cause is uh, a low vault. Sometimes it can be also because of surgical trauma. But uh, as you can see over here, all I do is to make the same 2.8 to 3 millimeter incision and then subsequently go in with a, uh, either the front loading forceps or a 10 zero forceps just bring out one of the uh, um, supports of the fake intraocular lens into the anterior chamber. Then with a hand-over-hand -hand maneuver through the same incision, you can bring this lens out. And because it's a temporal clear corneal incision of just about 2.8 millimeters, you can, it's possible to remove it even with 2.4 millimeters, both the Indian uh, lenses, which are made of hydrophilic acrylic, as well as the columnar lenses of the star. And uh, then subsequently you go ahead and... Uh, very often the concern is that there is a significant anterior subcapsular fibrosis. So sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to get an adequate rexis, but it's doable and it's also possible to use a femtosecond laser to go through the material of the uh, lens to create a capsular rexis. But that's not really necessary. That's the intraocular lens that has been used. The other factor is uh, use of uh, fake intraocular lenses in situations of iatrogenic keratectasia or keratoconus after it has stabilized. Supposing once uh, CXL has been done or because of aging, the cornea is quite stable, you can go ahead and consider this. But please remember the fake intraocular lens is only an alternative for glasses. If the patient is going to require um, hard contact lenses or semi-soft rose scale lenses or scleral contact lenses for visual rehabilitation, such a patient, especially if it's a decentered cone also, is obviously not a candidate for um, fake intraocular lens. 
but if it's a well centered cone like this which you could sometimes achieve after a intact procedure as in this case as you can see and the patient is uh, having a best corrected visual acuity of 66 or 69 with his glasses alone then this is a patient who do quite well with a fake intraocular lens the procedure as such is not much different from what you do in a conventional case and uh, yeah, basically all you have to this is a fairly old video of mine before i got the varion overlay that's the reason you see these markings over there most often these patients have require high powered toric and um, fake intraocular lenses and sometimes they can even be custom made to suit the needs of the uh, patient and usually the rehabilitation is quite good of course you don't promise absolute metropia but quite often you are able to debulk the both the spherical as well as the cylindrical component quite significantly and uh, um, mo most often make these patients uh, spectacle independent this is actually a patient who had got uh, LASIK done elsewhere almost uh, 17 years back. Subsequently, six years later, developed hydrogenic keratectasia. At that time, we were doing sequential treatment. We did a collagen tosslink case, then subsequently put a intax, and a year later did this surgery of implanting a fake intraocular lens. And this is the post-operative picture, and the patient regained almost 66 uh, uncorrected visual acuity. Of course, this is not the situation in all instances. And this is another case of uh, keratoconus where you see a single arc has been uh, placed in the eye and uh, again the cone got reasonably centered. Most important factor being whether the patient is happy with the spectacle correction. If it's contact lenses that is needed, then it's better not to go for fakic intraocular lens or fakic uh, uh, or even uh, um, what, uh, toric intraocular lenses because that may not rehabilitate the patient quite sufficiently. And uh, sometimes even after an excellently done um, <coughs> keratoplasty or a dalk or sometimes the, it's the astigmatism or the residual error, it compromises the results. In these situations, you can of course resort to a, uh, placing a fake intraocular lens. You have to be cognizant of the fact that it's a donor epithelium that you're dealing with and your surgery has to be as gentle as possible and use adequate amount of dispersive viscoelastics to uh, protect the endothelium. Otherwise, the surgery is not much different. And uh, that's almost the end of surgery. Uh, so excessive uh, bloating of the um, incisions is something that needs to be avoided. Way back in 2004, I actually started with iris clip lenses. The results were good, but uh, around 2008 or so, gave it up and shifted over to star eye seals, simply because there was progressive endothelial cell loss, even after uh, uh, a well done uh, iris clip lens and this is one of one such patient where uh, we had uh, she had excellent visual acuity and was quite happy with the visual rehabilitation but i got my first uh, specular microscope uh, just to follow up on these patients what we found was that progressively she was uh, dropping her endothelial cell count it has almost come to 1800 so we actually insisted on her removing the lens but the patient because she had very good visual outcome uh, in, wanted an alternative so here actually in both eyes of course one week apart we are doing the removal of the um, iris clip lens it's a fmma lens so we need a six millimeter incision and uh, removing the lens and subsequently replacing with a um, <coughs> star icl we do a significant amount, almost 50% of our cases, we also use the Indian fake intraocular -like lenses. They are more cost effective and I, I, at least in my hands, I find that they also work equally well as the, um, uh, the more uh, expensive imported lenses. And this is just uh, uh, the incision being closed down after the removal of the fake intraocular -like lens, the iris clip lens and uh, the um, star ACL being introduced. Other situation you can see in this, uh, uh, there's a significant amount of nystagmus that is there. It's only a surgical challenge because these patients are highly myopic. Even in these situations, we try to avoid putting in a, uh, giving any kind of uh, peribulbar anesthesia. And uh, once you get hold of the eye, have some instrument inside, you are able to control the uh, movement of the eye. And it's possible to go ahead and implant a fake intraocular lens in these cases also. Last of my videos, just a challenging situation where I actually thought it will be a walk in the park case. There's nothing to tell me that is anything different except for the extreme myopia that this patient had, myopic astigmatism actually. But what happened was as soon as I started implanting the lens, the cornea literally seems to be giving way. 
I thought I am doing something wrong. You can see the uh, extreme shallowing of the chamber and the uh, incision actually opening up. And uh, only way I realized that there's something wrong with the cornea. I think it's a brittle cornea that we are dealing with. And uh, um, when I made the side ports again, they also gave way. And this is perhaps the only fakic intraocular lens case where I had to suture up the incisions. And uh, I, I am thankful that I did not attempt any laser vision correction because of the suppleness of the cornea. I do not know how exactly the laser vision correction would have functioned in this particular case. Uh, we, though it doesn't, the surgery doesn't look any elegant, we managed to do complete the surgery quite adequately. And the results were so satisfying that the patient insisted on getting the other eye operated the ne next week, which followed almost exactly the same course with the incisions giving way and the need for suturing up. And this is the one week post-operative period. You see there is a significant vault and there's a lot of pigment deposits on the lens, simply because there's quite a bit of handling of the iris. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, can I request Dr. Rohit Shetty to kindly set up his presentation while we take questions? Uh, so, uh, any uh, quick question on uh, sizing for uh, fake IOLs in keratoconic patients? Uh, how would it differ from a normal patient? Yeah, in uh, keratoconus, the problem is the central area that uh, it's quite deep because you have a central bulge or something. Uh, it's uh, eccentric also. So, if you go essentially by the uh, AC depth at the central area you end up getting a slightly larger lens. So in these situations, what we do is to uh, take not only in the center, but also in four points in the periphery, in the mid periphery, at about five to 5.5 millimeters. What we find is that also doesn't work and it's not completely reliable. So when there's significant ectasia, we undersize these lenses by about 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters, and we find that works well. Initially, when we are not doing it, but going purely by the AC depth measurement, very often we had the problem of uh, excessive vaulting and sometimes the, even the uh, lens capture in the sense that the edge of the lens gets caught in the pupillary margin. But once we started undersizing these lenses routinely by about 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, that seems to work well. Uh, you previously we were giving almost a year's time, but now we, we have reduced it to about six months. You know, as far as the uh, visual uh, rehabilitation is good, the patient is a comfortable with glasses. We get at least uh, two or three sequential topographies which seem to be stable. We go ahead and implant a fakic lens. Just one question: uh, In post op, you find the vault is low or high. Otherwise, the patient is asymptomatic. Vision is great. So what are your indications where you want to, you know, do the IPCL or ICL exchange despite patient being asymptomatic? What are the I think that's a very good question. Previously, we thought 250 to 750 microns is the vault. But Mark Packer in his meta-analysis has shown that even less than 100 microns, uh, there are patients who have crystal clear lenses. I have a few slides on that which I even showed yesterday. There's a patient with one eye 80 microns, another eye, uh, the fellow eye 110 microns. Following up for almost seven years, the lens is clear, so uh, we are just following up, not doing anything. On the other hand, we have also had ASOCT proven vault of about more than 1,000 microns. But the chamber is uh, open and there's no zippering up, no, no pigment dispersal in the angles, and uh, the tension is under control, so we go ahead and just follow up these patients. I don't think there's any role for a peripheral hydrotomy in this case with a central hole, but you have to closely follow them up, and over a period of one year, if they're quite uh, normal, we just leave them as, uh, just follow them up. But if there is a, a propensity for a little anti subcapsular cataract, or if you find that the chamber is shy, the angle is narrower than 15 degrees, uh, significant pigment dispersal, then we go ahead and exchange the lens with a smaller lens. Thank you. One point would be at this uh, day and age, if you had to choose between a low vault and high vault, you would rather have a lower vault with the center of flow, the incidence of cataract is very less. Whereas with a higher vault, you can, in the long term, have potential side effects, goniosynechia and other issues, and of course, uh, rarely, especially in keratoconic eyes, we've had patients with that optic capture, the pupil uh, tending to slide under the lens, and that creates a lot of uh, photic phenomena for the patients. 
So would you be worried of any patient in the sense uh, where some patients, the STS does not really correlate with the Y2 act. I have had two patients where one I have implanted 13.2, it uh, was a low vault, I had to implant a 13.7. I don't think that they make lenses above that size, but uh, even in that one, the lens rotated. It was a toric lens, it rotated. So the first I had rotated, so I put a bigger size in the other eye, that rotated too. Now she was a six foot two uh, height girl, so I, probably uh, assumed it to be maybe a physiognomy issue. But are there such cases that, uh, you know, even after doing a height to height, you may still think, okay, it may not be the best. I way. absolutely agree with you. You know, I think we still do not have the white to white measurement and the sizing of the lenses absolutely right. We do not know whether it's a sulcus to sulcus measurement or white to white, what is the exact, but majority of the cases, I mean, most lens manufacturers are correlated their uh, sizing of the lenses with the white to white measurement. Usually it's about one to 1.2 millimeters more than the white to horizontal white to white you get. Unfortunately, it works well for most of the cases. Having said that, I've reviewed some of my cases where the lenses rotated. We had done nothing wrong. The sizing had been accurate, everything and on table, everything seemed to settle down. But since still there is a extra a higher vault or lower vault and lower vault means more greater tendency for rotation. So I think once in a while you come across these surprises. So even though you feel that you're not doing right, there have been cases when I have uh, increased or decreased the size simply because uh, um, for that particular case, it did not suit well. Fortunately, in these situations, the condition resolved. But it's not uh, very common. I mean, I think thousands of lenses we have done about 10 or 12 of them. Would you in custom make a lens which is bigger in size? Is yes, yes. It is possible to do that. And extreme myopia, extreme astigmatism, as well as the sizing of the lenses, it's even possible to increase the optic size of the lens depending upon the mesopic pupil that you get. Uh, Star doesn't make custom make lenses. It's only the Indian okay. manufacturers who do it Both for Both IOCare and Biotech give you large lenses, uh, customized lenses. But what do you take for the sizing then, the white to white? No, the white to white. The white to white, uh, because we did a study very recently where we measured seven different parameters, white to white, sulcus style, different instruments, UBM, ASOCT, and we found the thing which correlates best with the outcome is still white to white. And uh, despite whatever advances in imaging we've had recently, so I think we'll have to go ahead. We uh, take with three different instruments and we correlate, madam. So we have topolizer and then we have uh, digital caliper. To the extent possible, we ask the optometrist to not look into the reading, but I'm sure they do. And uh, they uh, would adjust the readings accordingly. So I agree, just like all of us would agree, it's still not a perfect science. It is, it is giving at least better ones than 500 what was... Oh, the, I think uh, any laser interface biometry, if you use, they don't measure white to white. It's more sulcus to sulcus. It's not limbus to limbus. So usually... The science of the instrument is such that they'll give you about 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeters more than the uh, conventional um, topolizers or the uh, calipers. We usually mash them up together and unless there is a pigment or a blood vessel there in the uh, exactly a 0 180, the topolizer or the op scan gives you fairly accurate readings. And if it line up, lines up with the one year calipers, then most often you're okay. Among the seven devices which we compared, 700, Dial Master 700 was one of them, madam. And uh, it did show a 0.3 to 0.4 millimeter oversizing compared to the other uh, digital caliper and uh, uh, topolizers. 700. 700. 700. Mm -hmm. What's your rectus approach for the 2.8 from the endothelium to that, you know, maybe. It's like 2.75 millimeters. <laughs> uh, from here, I'll say yes. <laughs> 